Not a ton of people here, but we'll make do. What's that? We'll make do. Um, so, exciting, exciting new person, Judge Barkley. Um, those are the dates. This book that we're reading, it's usually what I, the title is, the full title is A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge. But usually people call it the principles. Um, which is good because if they call it the treatise, it would be even more confusing. <laughs> All of these guys mostly write, basically wrote books with almost exactly the same name. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so this was published in 1710. Um, that's uh, 20 years after, no, yeah, 20 years after Locke first published the essay concerning human understanding, um, six years after Locke's death. Um, and uh, when, so as you can see from his dates, he was 25 years old. <laughs> um, right. Um, uh, so as I think I mentioned before about him, he was um, Anglo-Irish. Uh, he was born in Ireland. Um, but she was born in a castle in Ireland. <laughs> um, so he was part of the kind of occupying uh, British presence in, in Ireland. Um, and uh, he published this book, as I said, when he was still pretty young, also around the same time, a little bit earlier, his book, A Theory of Vision. Um, after that, he spent a lot of time in England, um, continental Europe, then Ireland again. Uh, and it was only like when he went after the, he went back to Ireland that he became an Anglican priest. So when he wrote this book, he was not. And he was certainly not, I mean, a lot of times you'll hear people call him Bishop Barclay. And he was a bishop. He was a bishop in the Church of Ireland, um, which the Church of Ireland basically means like the Anglican Church of Ireland. <laughs> right. So he was a bishop in the Church of Ireland, but that only happened in 1734. Um, um, and in between, he actually lived in America. I, I used to think, I don't know why I used to, well, I know why I used to think that it makes sense. He wanted to found a college in Bermuda. Um, and he like had been assured that parliament was gonna provide funding for this. So I used to think he went to Bermuda and he was waiting in Bermuda for the funding to come through. But actually it's not true, he was in Rhode Island. I'm not sure why he was waiting in Rhode Island for the funding to come through for the college in Bermuda, but anyway, that's what he did. The uh, funding never came through, and eventually he went back to uh, England and then back to Ireland. Um, and uh, he did write some other books after this, um, which, well, I've read the dialogues. He wrote a book of dialogues, basically basically trying to argue for the same position that he argues for here. Um, there might be some differences, but, um, and then much later, I'm not sure exactly, I didn't write like down the year it is, really a book called Cirrus, um, which I have not read. It's called Cirrus, and the subtitle is something like, On the Properties of Tar Water. <laughs> 
Our water is, I don't know, some kind of liquid that's made out of pine sap or something. And I'm not sure exactly what it is. But anyway, this book starts by explaining how, like, how amazing char water is, and it's like cures all diseases or whatever. And then apparently, like I said, I haven't read it. Apparently, it kind of drifts from there into like all kinds of weird medical school stuff. <laughs> so I actually wrote this down on a list of things I want to read this summer, but I don't know if I'll go. Well. But so in any case. Um, that's uh, that's an overview of who he was. He's also uh, he's an Anglican saint, so he has like a day in the Anglican calendar, like you could celebrate his his day. I'm not sure when it is. <laughs> oh. uh, okay, but um, so this book, the treatise concerning the principles of human knowledge. Um, it's a little bit weird. It was supposed to have two parts. So he wrote the introduction in part one. And then, at least according to him, he wrote part two also. But then when he was traveling to Italy, he lost the manuscript of part two. And he couldn't bring himself to write it again. So... <laughs> Therefore, the book we have has an introduction at part one, <laughs> which is a little odd, but um, that's the way it is. Um, okay, and the reading for this time is the introduction, and then the other time would be from part one. Um, part two, I think, was supposed to be about spirits. So it would be nice if we had part two, but I think that's true. Or magic. Anyway, so we don't have. <laughs> so um, so this is how Barclay starts, um, or like frames the issue here. Um, when we first leave common sense behind and try to think more carefully, right? And here he's thinking about, I guess, both Descartes and Locke. Um, um, we always run into, quote, uncouth paradoxes. Um, So, I mean, we'll see examples of what he thinks some of the uncouth paradoxes are, eventually. But we run into uncouth paradoxes. Um, actually, I mean, I guess you could say right away, one of the uncouth paradoxes or one of the results of the uncouth paradoxes is, is going to be skepticism about the existence of the external world. Or about what we think of, the existence of what we think of as the external world. Anyway, so... Um, and so Barton says, well, like, how can this be? Like, uh, it can't be because the faculties God has given us are in themselves defective. So, I mean, this is basically Descartes' God is not a deceiver argument, which, I mean, it's, I think it does play a big role in Barclay. It's interesting that it really doesn't turn up in Locke, even where you might expect it. So, you know, I didn't get to talk in detail about his, you know, his proof that I exist. And then, you know, with, where he, he really is thinking of Descartes and following him fairly closely. And even his proof of the existence of God is fairly similar to the third meditation proof. Um, but then when he gets to the existence of external things where Descartes invokes the God is not a deceiver argument, Locke doesn't even consider trying to use that. Why? I don't know. Um, but um, but in any case, it's it's back in a big way with Descartes. So um, it can't be that uh, the faculties are defective. We must be using them wrong. And that's Descartes' analysis as well. Right? In the fourth meditation, 
where he tries to explain the, or the possibility of error. Um, so uh, we must be using them wrong. And in particular, Barclay says, it's because we start with false principles. So that's why the book is called The Principles, or he was consuming the principles of human knowledge, because the problem about human knowledge is that we start with false principles. And so even though we're using our reason, which is in itself fine, right? It was, you know, works just perfectly. We're, and we're using it well, we, instead of getting closer to the truth, we get farther and farther away from it because we start with false principles. And there are two main false principles. There are two main false principles. Um, they're both, they have something in common. So they're both um, um, they both involve in attributing to the understanding or intellect um, an impossible power of freeing itself from sense. Um, and I mean, I think this is this is what makes it right to say that Barclay is a radical empiricist and a, more of an empiricist than Locke. Um, because in some sense, he's not, a, he's not a regular empiricist at all because he doesn't think that what most, empir most empiricists think experience is an interaction between me and bodies. And he doesn't believe in bodies. <laughs> so, but this is the sense in which he's an empiricist he thinks that our, 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 our intellect, any intellect actually, that's what's gonna be important here, is tied down to sense, can't get free of it. Um, and then when we try, we get these false principles that lead us to these paradoxes. So what are the two false principles? Um, so the first one is the belief in abstract ideas. And that's the one he's talking about in the introduction, right? And the reason I say that this is an impossible attempt uh, at an impossible freeing of the intellect from sense is that like sensation is always of particulars or an individual, right? Um, it's, uh, um, uh, you always see this snowball. You can't see snowball in general, right? But abstraction is supposed to be able to free you from that. That's supposed to be the thing that the human intellect can do, that the animals who live really sensible lives can't do. And Locke says, and uh, Barclay says, we can't do it either. It's impossible. <laughs> um, and the other one is um, inference to an external object. Right? That is. The sensation itself is something that happens to me. It's inside my mind. It's an idea in my mind, as Locke would say. Although, as we'll see, confusingly, Barclay, Locke, Barclay, and Hume, all three of them talk about ideas constantly, but they don't use the term exactly the same way. Um, so, uh, so anyway, like, you know, the sen sensation is something that happens to me. It's in my mind, um, it's, or at least it's immediately present to my mind. Um, but again, the thing that the human intellect is supposed to be able to do is to infer something beyond that that's not directly sensible, the external object. 
And again, and again, Barclay says we can't do that, it's impossible. And that's what part one is about. And what's important is, as I was starting to say before, these are not supposed to be limitations of human faculties, right? So like when Locke discusses limitations of human faculties, he a lot of times um, will stop and mention that perhaps angels don't have this limitation, right? And I mean, I think he's saying that not because he's super interested in angels, well, I guess Newton was really interested in angels for some reason, but I don't think Locke, Locke was super interested in angels. But um, you know, he's saying it uh, to in um, as a way of illuminating the conceptual structure here, right? That like this isn't a limit. This is a defect in our faculty. So it's a defect that could, in principle, be filled in. But it's just, but but we can't. We don't. We have only the defective faculty, right? Whereas Barclay, and you know, so that of course generates a, a version. I guess a relatively mild version. Depends how you look at it. It generates some version of the problem of evil, right? Like why did God give us a defective faculty? Um, so, but Barclay says. Um, um, these two alleged powers are absurd and impossible. It's not a defect in our faculty that we can't do this. And therefore, he says, really, no one has ever really believed in that. Um, we kind of have, especially like, learned, scholastic, medieval people, but then Locke, unfortunately, hasn't freed himself from that fully because Locke is the main target throughout the book, right? I mean, he probably already knows that. So, um, so like uh, these kind of like learned people have fooled themselves into thinking that they can do these things. Um, they, people who think of themselves as above plain common sense have pretended even to themselves that they have that they can do these things, uh, but um, but really no one can, and they don't even make sense. Now, I mean, this is this is going to be a relatively easy sell in this case. Right, like you can imagine people of good common sense uh, saying, when you say to them, hey, you know, Locke claims that you have these like ghostly universal ideas or whatever, and they'll say, oh, no, I don't, I don't have that. I just have good old, you know, sensations or whatever. Like you can kind of imagine agreeing with that. When you, then when you say, oh, and by the way, Locke thinks that there are um, material substances outside your mind that aren't dependent on your mind, they're not going to say, they're going to say, what? There are, right? <laughs> but nevertheless, Barclay thinks that, that actually what he's saying here is consistent with good common sense. This is, I mean, what, what, I, what I just now said is basically, so like if you pay attention, what I just, just now said is basically the structure of the second writing assignment. But you, I'm sure you haven't looked at the instructions for it yet, but you know, the instructions say basically to take something that seems undeniable, and then, but that Barclay seems to deny, and say, and, and give two responses on behalf of Barclay. Because he would give, because he would say both of these things, and the first response is that you know, if you mean um, what we ordinarily mean by X when we're relying on pure common sense, I don't deny it. Um, but if you mean this bad philosophical thing, then not only do I deny it, but I think it's absurd. 
right? So, you know, Barclay is always going to give both of those responses because, again, he thinks that although he's changing the mode of expression somewhat, he thinks he's saying what we all ordinarily believe. And in, in fact, it's like, again, the people who think they disagree with it can't really, don't really, because you can't really believe something absurd. You just kind of pretend they do. So it's what we all really believe. Okay. Um, so when we talk more about part one, I mean, obviously that's surprising and it's always from Barthes' first three years until now, it's always, you know, generated a like what the hell response. Like, you know, you know, what do you mean? We all really believe that I, I really believe that that table is an idea in my mind. What are you talking about? But we'll see how he tries to, to um, substantiate that. All right. But for now, we're talking about this this one. This is what he talks about in the introduction. The two are, are not unrelated, so I will have to talk about this one a little bit. But um, OK. So what is the problem with abstract ideas? Um, so it's somehow related to the question whether we can consider a part what, na what in nature is always blended. Let me have some of this stuff. So right, it's about the, the problem with abstract ideas is that they involve an impossible separation of ideas. Um, an impossible separation of ideas. Um, well, I'll just, I'll read how Barclay puts it. This is the introduction section seven on page nine of this edition. Um, It is agreed on all hands. So <laughs> when he says it is agreed on all hands, it basically means even Locke agrees. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I think he may be thinking about Descartes, uh, but for the most part, it, it's Locke. All right, so anyway, it is agreed on all hands that the qualities or modes of things do never really exist, each of them apart by itself and separated from all others, but are mixed as it were and blended together, several in the same object. So separation of ideas that are inextricably linked in nature. Things. This is what the proponents of abstraction think we can do. They agree that these things, these ideas that were separated, we're trying to separate, that the corresponding qualities or modes. You never really exist, each of them apart by itself and separated from all the others. But they claim that the ideas of them can be separated, and that's how we can achieve abstraction. Now, so this, at least apparently, is an allusion to what Locke says in the essay, book two, chapter two, section one. And I emphasize this passage when we. Uh, when I talked about uh, Locke, because I knew it was, it was going to be important here. So this is what Locke says here, there. Though the qualities that affect our senses are, in the things themselves, so united and blended that there is no separation, no distance between them. So that's the thing about the being inextricably linked and inextricably linked in things. But then what Locke actually says is, his claim, the ideas they produce in the mind enter by the senses, simple and unmixed. So, um,
Yeah, just a little bit out of order, maybe. But no, that's okay. So the disagreement is about something. The disagreement is supposed to be it is agreed on all hands. Locke and I agree that in the things these uh, ideas or qualities are, I mean, for Locke, it's important to distinguish between ideas and qualities. Qualities are in the thing, and ideas are in the mind. Barclay is making that distinction here because he's arguing with Locke, but he really doesn't think there is a distinction, right? Because there isn't anything in the thing, it's all in the mind. Right? So, but anyway, so they agree that in the things, these qualities are inextricably linked. Um, and then, so this is how it goes on in Barclay, but we are told the mind being able to consider each quality singly or abstracted from those other qualities with which it is united, does by that means frame to itself abstract ideas. Right, so the, the picture that Barclay is drawing is that in the thing, the qualities are inextricably linked with each other. And the mind is able to take them apart into different ideas. This is the mind. And that's abstraction. But when we talked about Locke's theory of abstraction, I pointed out using this exact quote. Now, again, Barclay doesn't quote this. I'm just, it just seems that this is the quote he's alluding to. Right? Because they both talk about. Uh, Um, being the qualities being mixed or blended together. It is agreed in all hands that the qualities are modes of things who never really exist, each of them apart by itself and separated from all others, but are mixed as it were and blended together, several of the same objects. Right? And that, that word blended is the same word Locke used in this passage to talk about it. So I assume that. Barclay is thinking of this passage, and yet when we're talking about Locke and abstraction, I so this is Barclay's picture. I pointed out, well, I guess yeah, I'm not making it clear enough. These things come into the mind together because they were inextricably blended in the object, but the mind takes them apart, and that's the independent. That's Barclay's picture. But when we talk about Locke, I pointed out that. What Locke actually says here is that though the qualities are in the things themselves, so united and blended, etc., to explain the ideas they produce in the mind enter by the senses, simple and unmixed. So according to so the way I described this when I talked about Locke was that like the first abstraction is performed by our sense organs. It's not in the mind at all, right? Like this. This one object affected our different sense organs different ways. And so from the beginning, we got ideas from it that were simple and unmixed. And yet, Locke says these are not abstract ideas, right? Because remember, like these simple ideas are the kinds that the infant first gets, but the infant doesn't have abstract ideas, right? So just this separation is not sufficient for what Locke calls abstraction. It's, it's not the result of a mental act, it's the result of the interaction of our body with the external object, and um, it's not what Locke calls abstraction. Now, I mean, of course, Barclay, like when I said this was Barclay's picture, this is Barclay's version of Locke's picture, I should have said, right? They like, call this Barclay's Locke versus real Locke, <laughs> right? In, in Barclay's own picture, there is no place like this, <laughs> right? It's all in the mind. So, I mean, in particular, Barclay can't, like the place where Locke thinks the separation happens is the place that Barclay denies the existence of. 
right? But mod six, the separation happens because of the interaction, the way the external object interacts with my body. But, uh, you know, bar six, there isn't anything there. <laughs> So, um, but still, like leaving that aside, it seems like um, this must mean that um, um, that Barclay actually disagrees with Locke not fundamentally about abstract ideas or not first only about abstract ideas, but they actually disagree about certain concrete or particular ideas. That is, some of the ideas that Locke claims enter the mind simple and unmixed, Barclay says they're inextricably linked in the mind. And that's what the real disagreement is. So, so, the, so, um, so, and that's why the alleged separation is impossible. Because um, it's not really in things that they are inextricably like, linked or, or blended. They're inextricably blended as ideas in the mind. So, okay, I mean, so so in other words, there's some kind of thing that Locke thinks of as having multiple components that the mind can take apart for the purpose of abstraction. That Barclay thinks um, there's really just one thing there that you look at from different points of view or something like that. Okay, so I mean, so far so good. I mean, so far so sort of good, right? It means that Barclay didn't really portray Locke's position exactly right. He wasn't exactly fair to Locke, yeah. Um, is the squiggly line there supposed to represent them being fixed in the mind? Or is that the squiggly line? Or is that squiggly line? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the one, the yeah, other no. This is, I was saying that basically there's a case where Locke thinks that there are things in here that we can separate. Um, um, because they enter the mind simple and unmixed. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe this picture isn't really sufficient to, to, to show the difference, but. I mean, okay, like, so at least what I heard Locke really thinks is that the ideas enter the mind simple and unmixed as particular simple ideas, then the mind, like, goes through those operations of memory and discernment and, you know, and so, and, and compounding and makes a compound, makes a, like, complex uh, particular idea. Um, and then it's only once you have ideas put together by the mind in that way that the further operation that he calls abstraction can happen. So, you know, so this is a prerequisite for abstraction according to Locke and according to Barclay, this can't happen because some of the things that Locke thinks are, are entered separately in the first place are like didn't enter separately because they're inseparable. I mean, I'm describing this very abstractly for now because the next thing I'm going to ask is, okay, so what does Locke think is separable that Barclay thinks is inseparable? Because it's not at all easy to see what the disagreement is about. But are there are there more questions before I go on? I, I don't know. This picture probably is no better than the whole picture. <laughs> yeah. So this is... Barclay's interpretation of law. And this one. That one. Yeah. But Barclay doesn't even think that happens. It's just all in the mind. 
Right. And as I said, like part one is going to be where he really argues for that. Right. But as I also said, the two parts are kind of related. So I already have to start saying something about it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, for now, Barclay isn't making that point. He's talking as if he agrees with Locke that there's things outside that have qualities blended in them. Um, he, he really doesn't. But the, you know, but the, but the question is, like, again, the, um, is he representing Locke correctly? And I look back at that quote and I say, well, no, not really. Locke doesn't say that. Um, um, that the first separation of the things that are inextricably bound together in the external thing is the operation of abstraction in our mind says that our sense organs do that before they even get to our mind. Yeah. Um, so, and so then I was claiming that it, like basically, it, maybe I can put it this way. The disagreement between Barclay and Locke is not exactly what Barclay leads you to believe it is because he doesn't portray Locke exactly like it. But there is a disagreement. And if you, if you, put in the right understanding of Locke, you can see what the disagreement must be about. It must be that um, um, Barclay, there's, there's, there's something that Locke thinks of as a pair of different simple ideas that Barclay thinks are not really different simple ideas and can't be taken apart. And so, you know, when Locke says that these two enter the mind, simple and unmixed, Barclay will say, well, no, I mean, there's no such thing as those two things not being mixed with each other because they're inseparable. So, I mean, again, like, I think it will help if I start talking about examples or it should help. So, um, because, Um, and now I'm actually going to have to read something from the beginning of part one. And maybe a couple things from a little farther on in part one, too. So this is what Barclay says things are. So this is part one, section one on page 23. So first he says that by the various senses, I have these different ideas. By sight, I have the ideas of light and color. By touch, I perceive hard and soft, etc. Right, and then he says, and as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name, and so to be reputed one as one thing. Thus, for example, a certain color, taste, smell, figure, and consistence, having been observed to go together, are accounted one distinct thing, signified by the name Apple. So it sounds like Barclay is agreeing with Locke that we get different ideas from different senses. We notice that certain ones always go together. And we, from that, we form a, based on that, we, we do something. And Barclay doesn't say exactly we form a complex idea. He says we assign a name to them together or something like that. But anyway, we do something that such that we end up counting these things that are really distinct as these ideas that are really distinct as aspects of the same thing. And I mean, according to Barclay, this is the thing. Right, according to Locke, this is the idea of the thing, but according to Barclay, this is the thing. <laughs> okay, but the point is that um, it, it doesn't seem like when you talk about the smell and figure and taste and whatever of the apple, those are not in, it, so like those, according to Locke, those are inextricably linked in the apple. So you might think that there would be a case where where Barclay would disagree with Locke, and Locke would say, you know, and they're they're inextricably linked in the apple, but they come in as separate ideas, and then I have to put them together and whatever. But actually, no. In this case, Barclay agrees with Locke. 
they come in they come in separately and i i count them together as as attributes of one thing um and i think it's uh um, um Barclay gives examples like this. So, I mean, first of all, Barclay says in um, back in the introduction, section 10, page 11. To be plain, I own myself able to abstract in one sense, as when I consider some particular parts or qualities separated from others, which though they are united in some object, yet it is possible they may really, really exist without them. So, right, I mean, he gives an example of like, um, um, that example, he gives an example of like, Imagining the head of a man without the body of a man, or something like that. Right? He says, if you want to call that abstraction, yes, I can. I can form an idea of the head of a man without the body of a man because the head of a man can exist without the body. But um, the smell of an apple can exist without the color of an apple, and. Um, um, and in fact, uh, another example that Barclay gives in part one, section five on page 25, is that I can conceive the smell of a rose without the rose. So without the rose, he means, of course, without the other qualities of the rose. <laughs> so I can conceive the smell of the rose without the color of the rose and the shape of the rose and whatever, right? So, um, so that is the kind of abstraction that Barclay agrees we can do. So the question is, um, what are the what are the ideas that Locke thinks can be separated and Bar Barclay thinks can't? And. Um, I think there are actually only a few cases, and they're they're all weird cases. <laughs> that is, they're all already weird cases in law, um, but they turn out to be very important cases. So, um, and like I know of, of three, there might be um, more, but I you know I don't think this is exhaustive. But I I could I've only been able to identify three, so. One is abstraction from simple ideas. Right, so a type of example that Barclay gives a lot is um, like forming the idea of color by abstracting from what the color, what white and black, you know, what is different about white and black, and only considering what is common. To and then you form a general idea of color. And actually, this turns out to be kind of important because um, when he talks about the abstract idea of a human being, the or the abstract idea of man, as he puts it, um, he says, you know, um, um, the idea of color must be part of it because a man must have a color. But it can't be the idea of white or black or any other color. So the reason the abstract idea of a human being is impossible is because it includes this abstract idea of color. Now, like, you know, what Barclay is thinking about the different colors of human beings is interesting to ask. He did, while he was in Rhode Island, he did own slaves. <laughs> um, so he, he didn't just, he didn't wait like in a hotel room in Rhode Island. He, he waited on a plantation. <laughs> uh, 
and we, we bought some slaves to work on the plantation. Right. So anyway, but getting back to more uh, uh, metaphysical issues here, I mean, the question is, how is this supposed to work in Locke? I mean, Locke does think we have an abstract idea of color or, or a general idea of color of some kind, but obviously, Locke thinks the idea of white is a simple idea. That's one of his most common examples. So that kind of kind of abstraction can't work by taking apart the you know the part of the idea of white that it has in common with black. It doesn't have parts. And in fact, when Locke talks about this, he actually talks about this down. I don't think this is in the reading, but he gives a different example, a different explanation. He says that kind of abstraction that we're really Color really means an idea that's only received through the sense of vision. So, um, so it has to the, the abstraction has to do with considering the common relation that the ideas of white and black have to something else, basically, namely to our sense organ. Um, so, I, so anyway, so so this so this is a weird example, and this is like doesn't. Uh, throw much light on what the general disagreement is about, I think. So a second example is, um, well, I mean, I guess there's two subcases of it. One, which is the one that, that Barclay mostly discusses, is color and shape. And here by shape, we mean visible shape. And Locke, Locke himself, I think, really, although he, Locke says things like we get the idea of shape both from touch and from sight, I, I think Locke himself really doesn't think that those are the same idea. Right. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a place where he discusses what's now called the, the Molyneux problem, um, because I guess it's called that because Locke, well, I don't know, Locke knew this guy, Molyneux, who came up with the problem, and Locke reports it and gives his answer to it. So the problem is, suppose there was someone who was blind from birth and had learned to distinguish between different shapes by feeling them, and now all of a sudden they get vision. Will they be able to tell right away by looking at the shape, what shape they are? And Molyneux and Locke both think the answer is no. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, when I say color and visible figure, and, and, and on the other hand, Barclay, the whole point of his book, The Theory of Vision, which as I said, he published a little bit before this, is precisely that, that, that you know, the ideas we get through vision are not really this at all the same ideas that we get through touch. We we start to think they are because we use one to stand for the other, something like that. So and so anyway, so this is one example of color and visible figure, and then you have to add in other things like visible motion. Oh. Um, and then the second example is primary qualities, tangible primary qualities, right? So you can see why I'm separating this out because color is not a primary quality. And like, we don't know exactly what, how Locke would explain or whether he even, even agreed that there can't be visible figure without color. Right, like sometimes when he talks about what microscopic eyes would be able to do, he makes it sound like he would, we would be able to see figure without color. <laughs> um, but in any case, these, you know, we know Locke says a lot about, and in what sense they're inseparable, right? So it's validity plus the other primary qualities, figure, emotion, whatever, right? Um, and, um, um, 
we know that Locke agrees that these are in some sense inseparable. But uh, on the other hand, he does think we have abstract ideas of them, right? Like we can form the idea of solidity, an abstraction from figure, motion, et cetera. And um, Barclay comes back with examples like that over and over. So that's something they disagree about. And then the third case is, well, so remember I talked about those weird, very abstract ideas in Locke, the ones that come in with every other idea. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, that if I could call them whatever I wanted to, I would call them transcendental ideas. But, you know, but we don't have to worry about what that means, but we know the examples of them are existence and unity and perhaps some others like power. Actually, I listed power and limit. Um, so uh, these also, so first of all, these also Locke agrees are in some sense inseparable from other ideas. Right, you can't have an idea without the idea of existence. Because uh, the connection that there is between the idea and the any idea and the idea of existence is that agreement which makes the proposition true that the idea exists. <laughs> yeah. Right, and we ever have an idea that exists in our mind, so we every idea is always connected to the idea of existence. And similarly with unity. Um, and as I argued, probably also with these other ideas. But so in any case, th th this again is a case where uh, Locke thinks that um, That in a sense they're inseparable, but in some sense they are they are separable, and this is the way they're separable. At least this is what I argue when I talk about Locke's theory of abstraction. I think I mentioned this art even last time again. That you know, so the, the connection of the idea of existence to this idea. So let's say this is the idea of what. And this, this connection is agreement of the fourth kind, right? I mean, remember, you know, agreement of the first kind is identity. Agreement of the second kind is resemblance, similarity. Agreement of the third kind is coexistence of the cause and the external object. And agreement of the fourth kind is this kind of agreement. <laughs> So this kind of so so this agreement means that the idea of white itself exists when right now whenever I have it, but it also means that the object of the idea exists, the external object, right? Like here's the mind. <laughs> this actually is part of all inside the mind, but here's the operation of perception. Or sensation. Its immediate object is the idea of whiteness. Um, um, its immediate object is the white thing, the thing with the quality of whiteness outside the mind. And um, And the way I first get the idea of whiteness when I'm an infant or whatever, um, uh, I don't know what the best way to say this is, but I guess I'll just say like, and so norm, so what, when does the external object exist? 
And right, and the answer is, well, uh, it either exists now or it used to exist in the past. Because this is a simple idea and the mind can't make its own simple ideas. So like, if I attribute existence to this idea now, I'm attributing existence to its object at some time, either now or in the past. Um, and the operation of abstraction, according to Locke, according to Locke's real theory of abstraction, involves separating this idea from that, from, from the connection to some time and place and other uh, concomitants of existence. That's the separation that Locke thinks we can make. So like when I, when I separate this idea of white, when I, when I come to treat it as existing in my mind and don't attribute that existence to a specific time that its external object exists, that's when I have the abstract idea of what. So that's all according to Locke. Um, and again, Barclay is going to say that um, there is no such separation to be made. Right, so among the abstract ideas that Barclay is going to say that we don't have are existence and unity. That there is no such thing as the idea of existence or the idea of unity. And so this separation that Locke wants to make, again, is impossible. And I mean, again, you can see how this goes together with the doctrine he's going to develop in book one. In part, sorry, in part one, right? Because, you know, so what Locke thinks we can separate the idea from is the attribution of a time to its external objects. A time which could be different than now, the time when I have the idea. Um, so when we separate it from that, that's when we form an abstract idea. But again, Barclay doesn't think this whole part is there. Um, so, um, um, this idea is the white thing. Of course it exists now. Right? So there, there isn't something else that I can, I'm attaching a time to that I can kind of withdraw it to from in order to form an abstract idea. So, I mean, if everything I said is right, this is actually really the crucial case, right? Like if we can't, um, um, in a way, in a certain way, separate existence from an idea, then we can't do what Locke called abstraction at all. And it doesn't matter whether, you know, uh, any other ideas always go together or not. Um, uh, because again, in Locke's real theory of abstraction, it's not the simplicity of the idea that makes it abstract. It's the way I, <laughs> attribute or don't attribute existence to its object. Um, so, um, so, so first conclusion out of all of this is that, um, that although Locke, although Barclay doesn't describe Locke's theory of abstraction very well, 
and the attacks on it are not necessarily fair. But the, the real disagreement they have does amount to Barclay thinking that what Locke calls an abstract idea is impossible. Any abstract. Right? Like, so for example, the smell of the apple, you know, um, Locke doesn't think that when an infant or a non human animal just smells an apple and doesn't see or feel it, that they're having an abstract idea. They're having a particular idea of whatever smells like that now. Um, and um, um, so, like, Barclay, in agreeing that we can have that smell separately, is not really getting closer somehow to a, to what Locke calls an abstract idea. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the way ideas uh, are become like abstract to do their existence, is is that like is that like if you smell an apple without seeing it, only just having to like smell of it, like the smell of existence? Be abstract for what exactly well, so, so the point is when you like when an infant has the um, I mean the example Locke actually discusses is sweetness, right? When the infant has the simple idea of sweetness, they it's for the that's not an abstract idea of sweetness in general. It's an idea that represents whatever is making them perceive that idea right now, here and now. Right, it's not separated from the concomitance of existence. So, I mean, it's like, it's true that the infant hasn't like, uh, put that together with other ideas to form what we call the idea of a sugar plot. Um, but that doesn't mean that the infant's idea is super abstract somehow. It's not abstract at all. Um, um, and it's only later when the infant learns language and starts to form abstract ideas that the infant can form an abstract idea and the, the, the well now I guess no longer infant but the, <laughs> the, group, the, the, the uh, toddler can <laughs> form the um, uh, uh, abstract idea of sweetness or the abstract idea of sugar plum. Right? Sugar plum is more complex, but it's not like um, less abstract. I mean, I, as, I, as I think I said when I talked about Locke's view in more detail, I, you know, I think, you know, like what Locke says about this is confusing or and or this could be evidence against my interpretation of Locke, that Locke does sometimes seem to equate like more general with more abstract, right? And therefore, like calling these ideas very abstract or something like that, the most abstract possible ideas. Well, still, I don't know why could they could they be more abstract than any other simple idea. I, well, they are in a weird way, but anyway. Transcendental ideas are not generic. Super generic. But anyway, never mind that. So the point is, um, um no, what was the point? Sugar plums, like that sugar plums. <laughs> um, oh, right. So, so Locke does talk as if, like, kind of, there's like stages of abstraction. And first, you form the abstract idea of parrot, and then you form the abstract idea of bird. And that's like more abstract or something like that. But, um, but I think if you look in detail at how he thinks, how he says the process of abstraction works. Um, uh, you'll see that there's really one big difference between particular and abstract ideas. And um, in that respect, all abstract ideas are just as abstract as each other. 
because again, none of them attributes existence at a time to their object. And that's why at a time, place, etc. And that's why they can agree with different objects. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. Did that help? I didn't remember what your original question was. Uh, I did. Yeah, it did help. Okay. You don't sound very sure, but. Oh, it's a very complicated topic. So it's not like there's one concrete answer that just like fixed everything out. But like it was like, just things you like have to explore. So that that was what I enjoyed. Okay. Um. So. Um, okay, so there's more things I want to go on to say about Barclay on abstraction, generally speaking, but first I wanted to go back to this one a little bit. Maybe I already said what I'm supposed to what I want to say about this. This so you know, um, So basically that, you know, Barclay says, I can't conceive of motion without figure, right? Like whatever can move must have a figure, must have a shape. Um, and from Barclay's point of view, the reason for that is that um, motion and shape are inextricably blended in the idea. Or really, I think maybe a better way to put it is there's really just one idea. You know, as I said before, like you can consider its motion or you can consider its shape, but you can't take them apart from each other. That's what Barclay thinks. Locke thinks that you can take them apart from each other. So you can form an idea of just motion. So when Barclay says, but well, wait, that's not conceivable, Locke's answer is going to be, well, you're, you're noticing something true about those ideas. But what you're noticing is that there's a visible necessary connection between them. And in that sense, one without the other is inconceivable, right? Meaning that if, like, if you get one idea, you know you can get the other one. And again, that's what I argued, that's what makes them primary qualities. And you, therefore, you know that whatever is the power to cause one idea, is, goes together with the power to cause the other. So now you know something about the structure of the object, the external object. So, um, I don't know. So Barclay, on the other hand, is going to say that in all those cases where Locke thinks there is a visible necessary connection, there really was just one idea. So this goes together with Barclay saying that, and, and we'll see, he says in book one, Ideas can't resemble anything outside the mind. Yeah, this was like this picture was my explanation of what Locke means by resemblance. Let's see little columns here. Qualities. Right. That what Locke means when he says the primary qualities resemble their ideas, he means that there's this analogous structure, this like isomorphism. 
And again, I can know that because this connection is necessary. It can't be necessary unless this connection is necessary. So, um, so Barclay is saying there aren't really two ideas to be necessarily connected to each other here. Is this goes together with Barclay saying ideas can't resemble anything other than ideas. Right? This this way that Locke has of of making sense of that, Barclay has taken away. So this example is all actually also, at least this part of it, I don't know what, as I said, I don't know what to make of this part of it. This example is actually also really important. Um, okay, are there, are there more ideas about, uh, more ideas. are there more questions about this before I go on to a slightly different topic? Not that. Okay, I'm going to erase this thing. Let me finish. Um, so Barclay traces Locke's error. And I mean, again, he says that this is everyone's error. It's a universal error that's happened everywhere, but he's really just talking about Locke. <laughs> um, um, so Barclay traces Locke's error in thinking there are general ideas to a mistake about language. And, right, he, I mean, he says, like, only something that always goes together with reason can explain the universal nature of this error. Um, and so, therefore, it's language. Although again, I don't think he has any other example really in mind of this universal error except could lock. <laughs> hey, uh, so, um, um, so how is that? How does language give rise to this error that we have abstract general ideas? So um, in the introduction section 18 on page 17, Um, he gives, I think, two different reasons. The first one is his thought that every name has or ought to, ha ought to have one only precise and settled signification. Um, right, so if we have a word like triangle, it has to have one only signification. And, you know, it can't signify this figure because this figure is different than this figure. Yeah. So it's, <clears throat> this is, I think, one of the things that Locke talks about the why we need abstract ideas, because there would just be particular names for everything. Is Berkeley or Barclay arguing for that? Well, Barclay is saying that it's, it's trying, I mean, so first of all, Barclay is thinking of those exact passages in Locke, and at some point he actually cites them in a footnote. Um, so, uh, um, but he's saying that, that the way Locke thinks about that has led him into the mistake of thinking that we must have abstract general ideas. Um, and, and like, again, Barclay thinks that we couldn't possibly, I mean, it's funny, like sometimes he says things like, well, if someone claims to have these abstract ideas, I can't argue, you know. But he, I think it's pretty clear that he, he doesn't really believe them, that he doesn't think it's possible. <laughs> so, um, um, right, and I was just, but I was just trying to explain what, yeah, this is partly thinks the mistake is to think, Oh, we have this word triangle. 
and we use it for this and for this. But these aren't the same, so neither of these could be what it signifies. It has to signify one thing. And what is that? That's the abstract idea. Um, but the second problem is and this turns up in section in the next section on page 18. Um, the opinion that language has no other end but communicating our ideas, and every significant name stands for an idea. I mean, So we've said the idea of the, the one mistake is to think that the idea of triangle must stand for some one thing, and the other mistake is to think that it must stand for an idea. Um, Or that the purpose in using it must be to communicate my ideas. Um, now that the first explanation by itself, I think, um, I'm not sure what to do with it by itself. I mean, like. Well, I guess I mean I guess I'll come back to it and and try to explain uh, why it might, because I guess like the question is, okay, why do we think that? Why do we think the word must signify some one thing? Like, why is that, why is that such a universal error? So I think there is a reason Barclay thinks there's a universal error like that, but I don't think he explains it very well at this point. Um, but the second one, I want to start talking about that one first. The, that language, the opinion that language has no other end but the communicating our ideas, and that every significant name stands for an idea. So, I mean, remember that that's not exactly Locke's view. Locke agrees that we use words for things other than signifying ideas. Um, he just thinks that, except when we use words to achieve clarity and order, um, uh, there's no proper use of words except communicating ideas. Right? Clarity and order, remember, are the two things that he thinks that the legitimate parts of rhetoric. And actually, in the chapter, I'm almost thinking I should assign this chapter. I mean, not this year, I mean, but the other years. Um, the, the, the chapter in book three called Of Particles, where Locke talks about the use of words like is and and. Did I mention this before? No? Okay. And, you know, he says basically that these words uh, don't express their own ideas, but they're very important because we use them to convey the order and, uh, of our ideas, order and relation of our ideas, something like that. So, I mean, I think uh, like actually Locke agrees that there is a proper and important use of words other than communicating ideas. And it, it corresponds to the part of rhetoric that's legitimate, order and clarity. But okay, you know, so leaving that aside though, other than words like that, Locke thinks uh, um, that yes, there are other uses for words besides signifying ideas, they're just not good uses. Um, 
And so, you know, when Barclay, one of the objections that Barclay makes here, therefore, really kind of misses the mark, right? So the first objection, so right, we're talking about the few that, um, every significant word, right? Like every meaningful word signifies an idea. And Barclay's first proof that that's not true is he says, um, Actually, this comes second, but I'm going to discuss it first. He says at the beginning of section 20, the communicating of ideas marked by words is not the chief and only end of language, as is commonly supposed. They are other ends, as the raising of some passion, the exciting to or deterring from an action, the putting the mind in some particular disposition. To which the former is in many cases barely subservient and sometimes entirely admitted, omitted when these can be obtained without it. Right? So, what this means is like, um, you know, Barclay is saying, um, why do I want to communicate ideas to you? Like, suppose the sentence that I say is, give me the gold. <laughs> why am I? trying to communicate the ideas of giving and me and the goal to you. Because I want you to give me the goal. <laughs> right? That's the chief end of language in that case. And the the communication of ideas is subservient to that end. Right? I want you to have those ideas because I can't get you to do what I want without getting you to have those ideas. But if I can get you to do what I want without giving you those ideas, that would be just as good. <laughs> right? So when it's not needed, it's often entirely omitted. So, I mean, I think uh, that objection, as I said, like misses Locke in a certain way. I mean, that is, again, there is a real disagreement, but you can't tell from the way Barclay states the objection exactly what the disagreement is. Because, you know, because, because again, Locke knows perfectly well that I can use words to get you to do what I want, and that I can do it um, without communicating to you any ideas, and that um, that may be what I, that may be what I call good, because it brings me pleasure, right? But it's, but Locke thinks it's not going to be morally good, because it's not socially useful. And it's not socially useful because truth is, you know, the, like the thing that's most useful, <laughs> something like that, right? So um, truth and, and, the, and the proper use of reason to discover truth. And so if, you know, like if I, if I can get you to do what I want by getting you to put ideas in a wrong order or not in the order suggested by reason, I shouldn't do it. Um, so, so again, like what Barclay is talking about, the use of language Barclay is talking about is one that Locke is perfectly familiar with. Um, but the other objection I think is more relevant. And this is what Barclay says. A little attention will discover. So this is the end of section 19 of the introduction. These are both on page 18. A little attention will discover that it is not necessary, even in the strictest reasonings, significant names which stand for ideas should, every time they are used, excite in the understanding the ideas they are made to stand for. In reading and discoursing, names being for the most part used as letters are in algebra in which though a particular quantity be marked by each letter, yet to proceed right, it is not requisite that in every step, each letter suggest to your thoughts that particular quantity was appointed for. So the thought roughly is 
that you know when I go through algebraic reasoning, and I write you know this, and then I write. And then I write, you know, this. So, um, so, uh, the X is significant throughout this reasoning, not because it refers to something outside my, you know, the things I've written down. Um, um, but rather because I have rules for, as he puts it, proceeding right, the guarantee that at the end I'll be able to, be able to um, interchange X with a different kind of symbol, with a symbol for a particular number. And if I proceed, well, I mean, that is, in this case, they guarantee. In other cases, I may or may not be able to, but um, if I can do that and I proceed it right, then uh, um, I know that, for example, I can now put minus one into all the places where I had X here and it will be true. But in order to do that, so like, so it turned out that X meant minus one, but the right way it meant minus one is not by pointing to something outside of language, right? Not by being a name of minus one, but rather by being involved in these syntactic rules that allow me to eventually eventually show that I'm allowed to exchange it with minus one. Um, and there, and that's why I can do this. I mean, the way he describes this isn't like he says, I don't always have to know what number it stands for at each step. But you know, in a normal algebraic procedure, you can't know what number it stands for at each step. Because when you write down the first thing, you don't know what number it stands for. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? But um, and and so and you might say, therefore, this is meaningless. Right? Like you wrote an expression that involves a name for you know not what. It's not a name of anything. So what you wrote down here is nonsense. So you can't go anywhere from it. But no, it makes perfect sense because this thing does have a meaning, but its meaning is syntactic, it's syntactic sign. Um. And I think, you know, the, the think about meaning this way, um, and so, so I mean, Barclay, as it's going to turn out later, think, really thinks the exact same thing about a symbol like that. Right? It's, you know, like when I write one plus one equals two, um, this is useful because if I proceed correctly, I can exchange this symbol for the idea of an apple, and I can exchange this symbol for another idea or an idea of another apple. The apples are ideas of apples, according to Barclay. But you know, so I can exchange this one for one apple and this one for another apple, and I can exchange this one for two apples. <laughs> um, um, that's what made these symbols significant was those rules that I by which I'm allowed to, you know, um, I'm allowed to exchange this one for an apple if I also exchange this one for an apple, etc. Right? That's what makes these symbols meaningful, not because they're about something called numbers. Um, and Moreover, you know, eventually he's going to say, and an apple also is like that. <laughs> but leaving that aside for the moment, so like, you know, and he's saying words, names are like that in general. They're like the letters used in algebra. And it's on this way of understanding how algebra works. 
right? Like, obviously, there's lots of other ways of understanding how algebra works, but this is the way he's understanding it. And I think this kind of understanding of what meaning is, um, I feel like this year it should be much easier to understand than the previous times I gave this course, because this is basically the way chat GPT understands what a word is. Right, like this is all it knows about it. It knows that certain rules for proceeding rightly, you're allowed to interchange that word with other words in certain ways, right? It's all syntax. It doesn't know anything about what the words supposedly stand for outside the language. Um, and it turns out, that uh, it seems to know quite a bit about what words mean, right? Like that kind of meaning, if it's not all of what we call meaning, it seems to be a lot of it, actually. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, that makes Barclay's point of view more plausible, maybe, or more understandable, if you think about that. Barclay is saying that we that's also the way we work. That's also the way we understand what words mean. I mean, of course, we don't only, only exchange them for words. We exchange them also for other ideas, like an apple or whatever, right? But, um, um, but that's really just more of the same according to that. Because again, the apple, the idea, the app, the, I, what we call the idea of an apple isn't about something outside the mind, an apple. There are no such things. It's just another counter that we're moving around. Or that God is moving around. We'll get to that. All right. So, um, so now, this is where um, I want to go back to. The other question about um, why we think a word must have a single signification. It must signify just one thing. So, you know, I mean, First of all, but, you know, here's what Barclay says about why it doesn't have to. This is sexual, section 11 of the introduction on page 12. And actually, first he quotes Locke, right? So he says, this is the quote from Locke. Since all things that exist are only particulars, how come we by general terms? And then Barclay says, his answer is, and the quote from Locke continues, words become general by being made the sign of general ideas. And then he's, you know, that's book three, chapter three, section six of the essay. And now Barclay says, but it seems that a word becomes general by being made the sign, not of an abstract general idea, but of several particular ideas, any one of which it indifferently suggests to the mind. Right, so the reason this this was this was the one mistake we were talking. Here's the other mistake. Every word signifies one thing. So right, according to Barclay, Locke thought that every word must signify one thing, and therefore, since again, clearly like this and this are not the same thing. The word triangle can't signify either of them. There must be something else that it signifies. And Locke says that's an abstract idea. And Barclay says, um, um, right, and Locke says the word triangle becomes a general word because it signifies that weird, according to Barclay, weird general idea, that abstract idea. And Barclay says that's not how it works. The word triangle becomes general 
by signifying any number of different particular ideas. So it signifies this, it signifies this, and it signifies, you know, all those other things that I could draw that we would know we're triangles. And at this exact point is where like a lot of people have thought that Barclay is missing something. Because um, suppose I come across something that I've never perceived before. How do I know if the word triangle signifies it or not? This is, I think, uh, um, Thomas Reed uh, makes this objection, um, among others. Um, he's a um, founder of the common sense school in Scottish philosophy, which I've mentioned before. Like the, the school that ended up dominating Scottish philosophy after he, so like after, after the end of this course, we had a course on further empiricists, <laughs> further British empiricists. That would be one of the groups we had to talk about. So anyway, so like, so, you know, so the objection is, so, you know, now here's this thing, does, so the, I know the word triangle signifies this and this. Now, here's this thing I've never perceived before. And I asked, does the word triangle signify this? Well, how can I tell? Well, I can't tell by comparing it with the word, right? I mean, the word is an arbitrary sign. Barclay and Locke agree about that. So there's nothing about the word triangle that's going to allow me to tell whether it signifies this or not. Um, well, can I do it by comparing it with some random previous idea that was signified by triangle? Well, the problem is that it seems like the answer might depend on which one I pick. <laughs> I mean, like if I compare it to this one, yes, but if I compare it to this one, no, they're different. <laughs> so it seems like the general word, it, it seems like this like syntactic answer can't work because the, the general word can't um, um, can't have the right syntactic behavior unless there's something that really is done. Right? So somewhere I have a really general standard that I use. And when I want to know whether the the, the sign triangle can be exchanged with this figure or under certain circumstances, I have to compare this figure to that really general standard that I have somewhere. Then I tell basically whether it's a triangle or not. And if it is a triangle, then I know that I can signify it by the word triangle. That's the objection, right? So the, the, the objection is that, that the thing Barclay is talking about, we, like we couldn't do it. We can't. We couldn't have, couldn't have rules like this unless we really did have general ideas. Um, So I think Barclay's answer to this objection is there is something that's really general, but it's not an idea. And what's really general here is the principle of my will. Right? That is, when I introduce the word triangle, I determine to use it in a certain way. And that's really general. That's that one determination of my will carries across all these cases. But that's not an idea. It's um, the act of a spirit. 
So, I mean, we're going to be hearing a lot about that in book one, but I mean, I mean, you, your like first reaction to that should be, well, hold on a second. You just talked about it, right? You just told us about it. Doesn't that mean you have an idea of it? And the answer is no, words are not always used for communicating ideas. Sometimes they're used for expressing the will. So when I say I have a will, I'm not trying to communicate to you my idea of a will. I'm expressing my will to you. In that case, in a very general way. Um, uh, so, um, so, so these different attacks on Locke's picture of language go together, right? There is a legitimate use beyond just clarity and order for um, ideas, uh, for words other than standing for ideas. And um, uh, in fact, in some sense, that's the, that's the overarching use of words. I'm always using them to express my will and try to influence your will. The standing for ideas is like a secondary part of that. And it's like useful for that sometimes. And we can only do it, like we can only even, I guess I could say, we can only say what it is to do it by using language the other way. Yeah. Can you say the word general, general understanding of that interchangeable with interchangeable idea? Like general, you're saying like it's like the basis of general understanding. How is like that interchangeable? It's not interchangeable in the It's um the gen the generality is like uh oh yeah, I've gone over time, haven't I? I'm sorry, I didn't even realize. I kept looking at my watch, but I kept thinking we ended at 8.55, but it's actually 8.45. All right, I'll, I'll just say since you already asked that uh, the, the gen, it's, generality doesn't mean like everyone, it's not general to everyone, like everyone has that idea. That would be similar to innate, or at least might be a prerequisite for innate. It's, it's the generality means like it's the idea of a general type of thing, like the idea triangle, according to Locke. It's not an idea of any particular triangle. Right. And what I'm saying is, according to Barclay, that, you know, when I adopt the word triangle as a sign, what I, the determination of my will is not to use it for this particular figure, it's a general determination to use it. For, for a lot of different things. So, and it, therefore, it's, you know, just like Locke, Locke's abstract idea, it can be the same thing in this case, in this case, in this case. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm sorry I went over. I didn't even realize I was talking. Uh, see you next week. Yeah.